Matthew 18, 1. Here it goes. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? In this question, at this time, we have revealed the wicked self-centeredness of the human heart. When, we, when I read this verse, I'm reminded of me. The Lord had just spoken about his betrayal and death. And these guys are talking about who's, who's going to be the greatest. I'm going to be the greatest. I believe that our greatest enemy is self. Be honest. Might as well, because God knows everything. As you and I make choices, typically, first, we think about how the choice will affect me. That's our nature. But the true believer <clears throat> also, thank God, has a new nature and is commanded to deny self, submit to God, and to be transformed. And with that new nature comes the ability to do so. Let's hear some verses. Luke 9, 27. You know this one. <clears throat> Excuse me, Luke 9, 23. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. <clears throat> deny himself. In James chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, it says this. <clears throat> he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So notice, even though it's our old nature is self-centered, with a new nature as believers, we're to deny ourselves, it says in Luke. Uh, in James, we're to submit ourselves to God. And then, of course, <clears throat> in Romans 12, 1 and 2, it says this, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So the believer with a new nature is told to be <clears throat> transformed submitted to God, and self-denying. <clears throat> and that's the battle, that's the war we're in. We have three enemies, <clears throat> or at least three main enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. And I like what uh, Lehman Strauss says, the world, our external foe, the flesh, our internal foe, and the devil, our infernal foe. Uh, and he's my favorite Bible teacher. That's just one of the many reasons why. But uh, you and I should desire, seek, and strive to become Christ-centered rather than self-centered. <clears throat> That's one of the marks of a person who has been born again. When a person has been born again, they seek the things which are Jesus Christ's. And I want to read that verse where I got that phrase, Philippians 2.21. Philippians 2.21. Paul the Apostle writes to the Philippians, <clears throat> and he says this to them. And the context is among believers, and not just among believers, but among ministers of the gospel. Not just ministers of the gospel, but Paul's circle of people. And in that context, here's what he says about them all, except Timothy. He says, all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ's. That's what Paul says. 
And that context is undeniably believers. And that's sad. Uh, and phew, I'm going to assume that we're worse off now than we were 2,000 years ago. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. What are you seeking in your life? That's a good question. The things that are your own or the things which are Jesus Christ's? You and I need to grow, don't we? We need to grow. <clears throat> we need to grow so that our choices will be made in view of how they affect God and his glory rather than only us and our will. You remember David's sin with Bathsheba? Remember how he committed adultery and covered it up with murder? Remember how he, the baby died? And remember all the sin and destruction which resulted in David's family as a result? Remember all that? Terrible sin? You know what's worse than all that? I'm going to read it. 2 Samuel 12, 14. Worse than all that. Here's what Nathan said to David. How be it, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. What was worse than the adultery and the murder and the death of the baby and all the sin and destruction in David's family? You know what was worse? That thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. That's what's worse. God's glory is the most important thing. God is the most important one. Is that how we think and speak and live? <clears throat> so the prayer then is for that we want to pray that God will help us to be Christ-centered instead of self-centered because of all the things we can do. We don't want to cause his enemies to blaspheme. We don't want to give occasion to the enemies of God to blaspheme. But rather, we should let our light so shine that men may see our good works and glorify our Father, which is in heaven. Listen to Philippians 2, 14 through 16. This is what you and I are to do. Instead of <clears throat> being self-centered, instead of seeking our own things and not the things which are Jesus Christ, instead of that, we should do all things without murmurings and disputings that we may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Back to Matthew 18. Verses 2 and 3 says, Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. The word there in verse 3, converted, <clears throat> converted. So they asked the Lord, Who's going to be the greatest, right? But Jesus says, you got to be converted. So before you can, before your position in the kingdom can be determined, you got to get in. You got to get into the kingdom. You must be born again. <clears throat> now the word converted is very similar to the word repent. It means to turn around or to turn back again. That, that is converted, conversion, <clears throat> to convert means to turn around or to turn back again. So, a, and in order for that to happen, a person must hear, understand, and believe the gospel. It says in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. It's the gospel of Christ, by the way, I find it so ironic that the new Bible versions take the word Christ out of that verse. 
and it makes the verse absurd. Then, Because it, it says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Well, then why did you take Christ out of it if you're not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, right? Uh, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. You have to believe to, to be converted. You must hear, understand, and believe the gospel. Listen to Matthew 13, 19, that one detail, understanding. Uh, remember the parable of the sower. Jesus said this, When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received the seed by the wayside. Notice that understanding is critical. Understanding. See? Uh, so <clears throat> when we are sharing the gospel... We need to be clear about what we're saying. It needs to be according to the Word of God. It should be the Word of God itself. But not just that. They don't just need to understand with their brain. They need to understand with their heart, with their soul. And that's going to take more than uh, my skills. It's going to take the power of the Holy Spirit to enlighten their eyes of their understanding. And so that means it's going to take prayer. It's going to take prayer. It's going to take a close relationship with God and abiding in Christ so that the power of the Holy Spirit is on that person to open their eyes and heart to understand. <clears throat> Verse 4, Matthew 18, 4. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> So not only must one become as a little child to enter the kingdom of heaven, but to advance in it, you must also have the humility and faith of a child. Uh, when a young uh, excuse me, when a child is young, before they've been corrupted by sin and Satan, they're humble and trusting. That's how children are. They're humble and trusting. They just believe what you tell them. They just believe you. And that's how we're supposed to be when it comes to God's word. Uh, the attitude of the child of God is this. God said it. It's true. And now I live my life according to his truth. That's the attitude. Uh, I believe that's part of what it means to be, come as a child. Uh, as I've said before, I think I said it last week, the way up is down. Humility, right? And that's what the Bible teaches. I didn't just make that up. Listen to Philippians 2, 5 through 10. Our ultimate example, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ. His way up was down. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, because of that, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The way up is down. If that's true for the Lord Jesus Christ, it's true for you and me. Uh, James 4.10 Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. This is a reminder, the reason why we're talking about this is because the Lord Jesus Christ was just talking to the disciples about his death and suffering, and they're asking who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now, so that's what this lesson is for them. Uh, he gave them a lesson, and there's a lesson here for us, of course. 1 Peter 5, 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he 
may exalt you in due time. We all know, we all know that God's timing is perfect. You know, we try to do things in our time, but God has a perfect time. And we're to wait upon him and humble ourselves before him and he'll exalt us in due time. That might not be ever in this life. And it's definitely going to be completely fulfilled in the next life. You know, that's when uh, the fullness of all the blessings come. Not now. Eternity. The way up is down. Matthew 18, 5. Whoso shall receive one such little child in my name, receiveth me. Wow. Whoso shall receive one such little child in my name, receiveth me. You know what that means? That means once you're a child of God, you are one with God. Listen to what he said. When he says such child, uh, regular children are applicable in this verse, but primarily it's talking about God's children in this verse. You. He says, he says, if whoso shall receive one such little child, child of God, in my name, receiveth me. Wow. That's amazing love. That's amazing honor. That's a wonderful God that the Holy One would identify with you and with me. You receive, someone receives you, they receive him. That's what he said. And that reality should break your heart with conviction and thrill your soul with joy at the same time. <clears throat> and this is one of the many reasons God's people will forever worship and praise him. And this is reason to do so now. Whoso shall receive, God will reward those who bless his children as well. Just like Abraham and his descendants had a blessing and a God had a blessing and a curse for those that dealt with them, that, that we, we have the same thing, even more so as God's heavenly people. Uh, Matthew 18, 6. But <clears throat> whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me. See, there's how we know. We're talking about believers. <clears throat> whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. To offend means to entrap, trip up, or cause to sin. You mess with one of God's children, or especially if you cause one of them to go astray from him and his truth, you're in big trouble. <clears throat> Let's listen to a couple of verses, starting with Acts 9, 4. <clears throat> Saul of Tarsus was on his way to Damascus to persecute God's children. And when Christ knocked him off his high horse, as they say, by the way, that came from the Bible. When, when, when God knocked him off his high horse, the Lord Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Well, the Lord was in heaven. He was persecuting the followers of Christ, God's children. But, but Jesus said, you're persecuting me. And that's exactly lines up with this. Remember, whoso shall receive one little child in my name receiveth me. Yes, God's children are one with him, and you're in big trouble if you mess with God's children. 2 Thessalonians 1, 6 through 10. <clears throat> now listen. <clears throat> Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense, that means to repay. It's a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. Okay, so those that trouble God's children are going to get repaid 
tribulation from God. And those of us that are troubled, his children, are going to be get, get paid rest. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe. <clears throat> Payback is coming. You want to be on the right side of that because God's going to repay. He's going to repay his children and he's going to repay the devil's children. <clears throat> Now, I do believe primarily that believers are in view in this passage, but of course I said already, I think it applies to children. So, since this applies to children uh, being harmed by others, I want to mention something, and I believe it includes all the people involved in the school system. From the teacher, to the people who write the books, to the boards that vote on it. They're in big trouble because they have certainly caused the little ones to sin. They've certainly caused the little ones to go away from God. Uh, anyone involved in teaching evolution and those who write the literature, they, they're better off tying a rock around their neck and jumping into the ocean. Uh, because let's face it, evolution is just a fairy tale to, to, to teach people that God doesn't exist and there's no need for God. That's what it's meant to do. It's, it's a religion. It's not, it's not only a fairy tale. It's a religion. People believe in evolution. Uh, <clears throat> so without getting on too much of a rant, uh, I believe this, this warning applies to them. Whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. And it's not just that. I just saw a, a horrible video yesterday of a father. I think he sounded like a believer, but a father was at a school board meeting reading out of a book, uh, different books from the elementary school kids and the middle school kids. And I can't even say the filthy, abominable and profane words that he read to, to, to expose what the little children were being exposed to in these schools. And we're not even getting to the fact that they're teaching them now that they're not boys and girls and stuff. So a lot of millstones, a lot of, lot of shock and uh, wrath and judgment is coming, especially to them that harm the little ones. So but you and I want to try to pray for the little ones and uh, lead the little ones uh, to the Lord with our prayers and our lives and our example. All but children, I mean, just, you know, just to go down a little more of the list, children, uh, children's entertainment, you know, the cartoons today are just straight up demonic. I mean, they will have little demon, I think is the name of a new cartoon, literally. And it's about exactly what the title says. So these are the cartoons today. You and I need to be careful with our own children and with the children in our lives. Like I said, we need to be a good influence and to pray for them. And we need to do what the Lord Jesus said. Suffer the little children and forbid them not to come unto me. Matthew 18, 7. Woe unto the world because of offenses. For it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. Remember, what did we say offense means? It means to, to trap, to trip up, to cause to sin. <clears throat> so when the Lord Jesus says it must needs be that offenses come, it must needs be that offenses come. He's talking about the current sinful state of the world. That is now after the fall, Adam and Eve sinned, and now we're all born with a sinful nature. Because of that, there's no escape in this current world system. It's woe unto the world. It must needs be that offenses come. 
It has to happen because that's the way things are now as a result of the fall. Unlike you and I, Adam and Eve were not born with a sinful nature. They were sinless. They made a choice, but they didn't have to sin. Woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. So although sin is now a part of man's existence, that doesn't mean we're not responsible for our choices. This these verses teach us that those who cause others to sin are in big trouble. And this is one reason why we need a good witness. We need a good testimony to affect those around us for good. This is why we need to heed the words of God. 1 Thessalonians 5.22 1 Thessalonians 5.22 says, Abstain from all appearance of evil. We talked about that before, about giving occasion for the enemies of God to blaspheme him. That applies with this verse as well. Abstain from all appearance of evil. You know, early on in my Christian life, uh, I don't know as much as I thought I did now. I thought I did then. But early on in my Christian life, I was gently told by an, a more mature believer that I shouldn't be living with Karen. Because I was before we were married. And uh, I was told I shouldn't be living there. And I agreed. He was right. Uh, but he, but I, I said, okay, that's it. I'm not, we're not going to sin anymore. But I don't have to move out because I don't care what people say. I don't care what other people think. I'm sure you have heard that and I'm sure you've said it yourself before. I don't care what other people think. But God says what? abstain from all appearance of evil. And I was such an immature believer at that time, I wasn't ready to receive that. I didn't get it. I didn't get it, but I get it now. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Why? Because of what people might think about you? Partly, but not primarily. Because you're going to give occasion of the enemies of God to blaspheme him. Oh, those Christians, they're hypocrites. They're fakes, they're frauds, they're phonies. And by the way, I guess I got to finish that story. By the way, I did end up moving out until we were married. Uh, uh, but it wasn't for that reason. It was because I eventually realized I couldn't resist the temptation. So I had to get out of there. Had to run out of there like Joseph, right? <laughs> Abstain from all appearance of evil. So that's what we need to do. Another reason uh, is that not only do we not want to uh, give God a bad name and drag his name through the mud, but we don't want to do what we're told not to do here, cause others to sin. Cause others to sin. Uh, what if I do something and then another new believer says, hey, if he can do that, I can do that. Even though it's wrong. Right? 2 Corinthians 6.3 we're told there, giving no offense in anything, that the ministry be not blamed. Now here's a big one. So not only are do we avoid all appearances of evil for the Lord's sake and for our sake and for the sake of those around us, but specifically that it says here, giving none offense in anything, that the ministry be not blamed. And boy, this is a huge failure today and a huge problem today. Remember the video we watched last week? Psh, they're not fault. It says, giving none of no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed. How many countless multitudes of people have been deceived into hell because of these money-grubbing false pastors, false teachers, and false prophets out there? Uh, people said, Psh, all they want is your money. God wants my money. That's what they say. That's what they say. Mm -hmm. And the ministry's blamed because of that. And so you and I, as God's children, we don't want that. Because everybody's got a ministry if you're saved. you got, you, you got a ministry. And so that's another reason that we have to take our behavior seriously. It's because the ministry may be blamed. But 
Let me tell you what the Bible says to those that cause the ministry to be blamed. And I mean specifically those false teachers and false prophets. Jude 1, 8 through 13 says, These filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. He dared not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. You got these guys on TV that say, I'm going to kick the devil in his head and punch him and that devil and all these silly things. Well, those people that say that are described right here in Jude. Listen to what it says. These filthy dreamers despise dominion. That is, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and dominion, right? Dominions is what it means. Uh, they despise dominion, speak evil of dignities. It's not talking about the president in the context. It's talking about the, the angels, fallen angels or holy angels. Yet Michael... The archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against the devil. Michael the archangel dared not bring against the devil a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke thee. And these guys get on TV, do what Michael the archangel dared not to do. But these, the false teachers, speak evil of things which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beasts. In those things, they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them. Talk about woe. Jesus said, woe unto the world because of offenses. Jews says, woe unto them. For they have gone in the way of Cain, ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward, and perished in the gainsaying of Kor. Korah. These are spots in your feast of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth, with without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. These are raging waves of the sea. Listen, this is the false teachers. They are raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Wow. You don't want to be one of them. And notice how they're called wandering stars. What is star a symbol of in the Bible? Angels. That's because these false teachers are controlled by spirits, evil spirits. So, judgment is coming to this world because of sin. And you can read about the details in the book of Revelation and other places. And the sin in the world is a result of the fall of man recorded in Genesis 3. We're all born sinners, as you know. <clears throat> but everyone who has not been born again in Christ will give a personal account of their sins to God at the great white throne judgment. And then they will receive their sentence accordingly. Although the word of God says that there is no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, praise God. Even believers will give an account to God when this life is over. It says in 2 Corinthians 5.10, we must all. You want, you want to mark every detail of God's word. God is very detailed. Listen to the words. We, the context is believers, people that are never going to go to hell. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he had done, whether good or bad. There is no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Praise God. But don't forget 2 Corinthians 5.10. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to receive for things done in the body according to that we have done, whether good or bad. So in light of all that, I repeat Matthew 18.7. 
Woe unto the world because of offenses. For it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. <laughs>